Stewart. Hey, Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise today to talk about the appalling rates of um, incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, deaths in custody and um, those with cognitive impairment that are being held in indefinite um, custody in this country. The Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage report released last week has highlighted the growing gap in incarceration rates in Australia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians make up only 2.3 per cent of the adult population, but um, make up over a quarter of the adult prison um, population as of June 2013. Between 2000 and 2013, the imprisonment rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults increased by 57.4 per cent, while the non-Indigenous rate remained fairly constant, leading to a widening of the gap. In 2012-13, the daily average detention rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people was 24 times the, non -indigenous, that the rate for the non-Indigenous young people. This is simply appalling and not enough is being done to address the issue, which is why so many people are calling for the establishment of justice targets, which will help provide a clear framework from which federal government, the federal government and the state and territory governments can work with communities and peak Aboriginal organisations to um, look at how we address this appalling um, statistic and appalling failure of our system. And the government cuts to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander programs, um, I deeply believe, will only make the situation worse as we see critical services lose funding or, um, at the moment, their futures are at risk, which undermines their ability to deliver their programs. There must be a, a commitment to fund critical legal services and advocacy services and community programs that um, help meet these justice targets. I was deeply disturbed when the minister last week refused to consider the issue of justice targets, which, as I said, community organisations uh, have been calling for for a long time, including, uh, including the Close the Gap campaign. Um, one of the bright spots um, last week also was the release of the Social Justice Commissioner's and Native Title Social Justice Commissioner's report on social justice and Native Title 2014. While his report um, had some very distressing information in it, it did, however, I say bright spot because it's shining a light on the issue. And government and everybody needs to have a good read and take to heart what is said in that report. One of the comments he made was around justice reinvestment. Where, and what he said in that report is, in the past five years, there has been, it has been encouraging to see so many people and groups embrace justice reinvestment. However, he does warn, it is all of this, um, in, um, in all of this enthusiasm, we have seen some confusion around what justice reinvestment actually involves. Some academics have warned of the potential pitfalls in justice um, reinvestment becoming a catch-all buzzword to cover a range of post-release, rehabilitative, restorative justice and other policies and programs, and thus lose both any sense of internal coherence and the key characteristic that, char char that involves a redirection of resources. In my view, it is not necessarily detrimental that advocates in Australia are already trying to adapt justice reinvestment for the Australian context. What works in the United States can be a powerful catalyst for action, but we will require thoughtful adaptation to the Australian context. Nevertheless, if the Australian brand of justice reinvestment strays too far from the evidence, we may lose some of the strengths of this approach. He goes on to say there is, is a growing body of literature on justice reinvestment, so this chapter will only briefly summarise some of the key principles and processes of justice reinvestment to provide clarity and context. He says justice reinvestment is a powerful crime prevention strategy that can help create safer communities by investing in evidence-based prevention and treatment programs. Justice reinvestment looks beyond offenders to the needs of victims and communities. Justice reinvestment diverts a proportion of the funds for imprisonment to local communities where there is a high concentration of offenders. The money would then would that would be, have been spent on imprisonment is reinvested into services that address the underlying causes of crime in these communities. In other words, in, 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 and my take on that is that we need to be investing in justice reinvestment. We need to make sure we get it right, that it works, and we need to customise it for the Australian context. For too long, governments at state, federal, and Commonwealth uh, state. Uh, territory and Commonwealth level have been sitting on their hands when it comes to justice reinvestment. We need to make sure that that is linked to justice targets, but it is a powerful way of addressing um, the issues that I have been talking about, about the, uh, 
appallingly high rate of incarceration for both young and adult um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. He also quotes an example of uh, the, Cow the Cowra Justice Investment Program and talks about some of the progress has been, that has been made there and that participation in the project by the Cowra community has enabled the team to identify issues underlying incarceration um, of its young people. Specifically, community groups and organisations have been consulted throughout the project to assist in identifying effective alternatives to prison, which ought to be invested in, such as holistic and long-term long initiatives and better integrated services. Young people will also be interviewed about their experiences and suggestions for change. These are the important programs that we do need to be investing in. And cutting legal services, cutting other essential funding, half a billion dollars worth out of the funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, is not going to help these types of projects. Of course, you can't talk about incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples without talking about deaths in custody and the alarming number of Aboriginal people who have died in custody since. Not, not, we're, we're not only talking about the um, number of people that died before the Royal Commission, but also since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody and, and the fact that the majority of the 339 recommendations made up by the Commission have not been implemented. And again, um, I need to raise in this place the death of Miss Jew, who died in custody in Western Australia, um, a 22-year-old in August. Miss Jew was not sentenced to a custodial term. She was fined and it was because of non-payment of fines that she ended up in prison and died in prison. Um, this has to stop in this country. We need to be addressing um, the issue of deaths in custody and not pretend that just because we had a royal commission that now all of a sudden it is solved. All levels of government need to show leadership in the implementation of the recommendations of the royal commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody and to develop programs that assist um, and address the unacceptably high rate of incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We need meaningful action. The other issue that I'd like to raise when I'm talking about incarceration is the incarceration of people with, in cognitive, with cognitive impairments indefinitely, and predominantly this affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It is simply unacceptable in modern Australia to be holding people in custody who have not indefinitely holding them in custody to people who have not been sentenced um, or found guilty of a crime or sentenced to prison. Many of the, the people that we are talking about have been found unfit to, um, try, to stand um, trial. But what happens is instead of making sure that they, we then look after these people, we put them in maximum security prison, not all of them. Um, some aren't in maximum security prison, but a lot are. We put them in there indefinitely. Um, and this, it's happening around the country. In my home state of Western Australia, um, last year there were 37 people with what was termed a mental impairment being held indefinitely in Western Australia. We have an obligation under our obligations under the uh, various conventions to make sure that we look after people with a disability. We also obviously uh, have, si have signed up to the Convention of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, it is unacceptable that people are held in jail indefinitely when they have a cognitive impairment. And we heard that again um, yesterday, that Australia had breached its obligations under the various UN conventions for four Aboriginal men with cognitive impairments in the Northern Territory. And the response we get from this government is to wash their hands of um, this issue, to say, uh, to disagree with the Australian Human Rights Commission's findings on, on the cases of these four Aboriginal men and to say that it is not their responsibility and basically attack the Australian Human Rights Commission for, um, finding, for the findings that they have made in terms as it relates to these four particular men. Australia has lost its way if we think it's acceptable that people that have been found not no, they have not been found guilty of any crime. They have a cognitive impairment. They, in most cases, they've been found unfit to plead and or to stand trial, and they are then held indefinitely in maximum security prison. It is unacceptable. And on the day that we are celebrating the International Day of People with Disability, it, we need to be committing to action to ensure that we address this appalling situation. 